This video contains spoilers for the Great Ace Attorney adventures and reference to spoilers in the Great Ace Attorney Resolve. You have been warned. I initially had a very different start to this video. More like I kinda didn't know how to start it. I always thought video essays had to be all fancy and flowy, so I tried to approach it like I would a college paper, but also that's just not me. So I trashed it. Be prepared for a lot of swearing and simping. I love listening to video essays and reviews and shit, but never did I think I'd ever come close to doing one of my own. Then this motherfucker had to go and wiggle his way into my heart, set up his little legal consultancy in the center, and just dorkishly stumble his way into the slot of my favorite video game protagonist of all time. Now, to some, probably most, <laughs> that sounds like a very, very bold fucking claim. And especially given I haven't exactly played a wide variety of games, but the way I felt throughout playing The Great Ace Attorney Chronicles is something I've never felt in playing a video game in my very short, near 20 years on this earth. And this is coming from someone whose favorite video game series is fucking Xenoblade Chronicles. Shameless plug, but go play those games, seriously. I remember very vaguely of this game's announcement. I heard a lot of hype from a friend who had played the fan translations, and I had only really experienced the first of the Phoenix Wright Ace Attorney games. Figured it couldn't hurt, and I had kinda been on a visual novel craze with buried stars and dabbling with 13 sentinels a few months earlier. I picked up the game on launch, grabbed a friend, and began the trek through the Great Ace Attorney adventures. Side note, I'll be referring to each case by their game number and case number, as does most of the fandom I've seen, so the first case of the first game would be 1-1. One, one. My initial memories of the adventure of the Great Departure are foggy. Binging it until close to 1 in the morning with a friend, voicing each of the characters until we got about halfway through and tuckered out for the night. My initial memories... At least about Ryanosuke were that of baby boy baby, for lack of a better way of putting it. He was adorable to me, but I was 100% simping for Kazuma too hard to pay him too much notice the first time around. Keyword, the first time around. Recently went through the first case again as a part of a replay I'm doing because I literally cannot get enough of this game, holy fucking shit! There's a lot to unpack in the first case. It's all very sudden, but I also don't think it's overwhelming. Japan being at a very infant stage in their legal system both adds to the stakes of Ryanosuke being convicted at any moment, but also gives you time to chill out and take a moment to think things through, especially with Judge Jikoku being surprisingly lenient with a man who's barely touched a textbook on law. It's a bit of that good whiplash seeing Ryanosuke's eyes pop out of his head and a shaky Yes! Come out for every contradiction he finds in testimonies, while Kazuma's at your side to be your sense of progression and ironing things out in a way that makes sense. At least before Ryanosuke starts to find his footing. Ryanosuke, very adorkably, mind you, stumbles his way as his own defense with Kazuma at his side. It starts with little pushes and reassurances from his, very hot, best friend before Ryanosuke is the one figuring out the intricacies of the case. I guess he has a bit more of a pass since he was actually at the scene of the crime and can attest to Josiah Brett being there and exposing the fact that the witnesses were lying, but shh. Without even the game telling you, which it does many, many times, might I add, you can see Ryanosuke's ability to piece together a scene, his ability to act as a forceful defense, if only a bit disjointed and awkward, which makes so much sense. He's a fucking English student for crying out loud. How this man manages to find his footing, albeit in the very big shoes of the up-and-coming defense attorney Kazuma Sogi, as a lawyer is damn near impressive. Call it cheap if you want, or the destiny of him being a Naruhodo and the ancestor of the great Phoenix Wright, but one one left me with a wave of curiosity to see where this man, who's probably never even thought of becoming an attorney, ends up with this newfound talent. I am someone who embraces media in two ways. Casually, or I hyperfixate. I'll admit, my first run through of the game, I put it down after the beginning of this case. The adventure of the unbreakable speckled band did the one thing that still stands as the one criticism I have with the narrative even if I know why it's there and why it makes sense. Through foggy vision, in the confines of one of the first-class rooms of the SS Buria, Ryanosuke Naruhodo wakes up to see the outline of his best friend's corpse on the floor of the room, and handcuffs on his wrists. When I had started this case, I remember audibly cursing out, Really? They're accusing him again? and even went on to vent about it to a friend privately about how I, even a bit now, despite knowing the narrative purpose, 
think it was a cheap narrative device. To me, at the time, it felt as if we had erased all the effort we went through clearing our name in the first trial, and killing off a character who had been such an integral part of getting us to that victory felt so sour and unfair. I put down the game after meeting Herlock Sholmes, the aftertaste of Kazuma's death too much for me to deal with. Looking back on it now, everything I was feeling was kind of exactly what Ryanosuke was feeling. Confusion, disappointment, shock, anger, sadness. I've been lucky enough in my life to not have any serious deaths in my family or group of friends, so I don't know what it's like seeing your best friend one day and them being taken away from you the next with no warning. My sympathy's coming in full force, and by the time of my replay of 1-2, I could understand him a lot more, both with having known future plot points and just having a bit more of an open mind when approaching the case. It wasn't until early December of 2021 that I found myself interested in the game again. A friend had been marathoning the Great Ace Attorney Resolve and assured me with a lot of confidence that the game gets better. The narrative gets better. At the time, I had nothing to lose. The friend in question, I trusted them with my life and I trusted their judgment just as well. So mid-December came, I popped in the game, and gave it another go. <laughs> and well, Foresight's 2020. I decided to live react to the game in a private Discord server of mine, something that I don't think I've ever thanked myself for until now because it has probably my favorite reactions of all time, and the first time I've documented my feelings on an adventure in real time. Now admittedly, there's a lot I probably can't show on YouTube without exposing myself too badly, but let's just say it was an instant simp for her Lock Sholmes and uh... Definitely saw the beauty of Ryunosuke's design despite its simplicity. 1-2 is a weird one, where we don't particularly have a case, but the objective is the same. Find the evidence to defend our client, well, well in this case ourselves again, and along for the ride is the ever distrusting, at first, and master of her own martial arts, Susato Mikotoba. An absolute gem of an assistant that Maya wishes she could be. Please don't attack me, Phoenix, right, Phantom? It's here, as described before, where I found myself empathizing with Ryunosuke a lot. His sorrow at the loss of his friend is something I will unfortunately have to sympathize with, but the rest of everything he dealt with in the case? The awkward sheepishness of dealing with Sholmes' eccentricity, the little snickers of humor at Susato's dedication to a man so clearly unlike the story she's read of him, the conflicted sympathy at Nicolina Pavla's story and the crewmates alongside the covering of her crime, and the unwavering willingness to see it to the end, to figure out the truth of Kazuma's death. I felt right there with him, and frankly, I don't think I've ever felt that way about a protagonist before, but I'll get more on that at the end of Adventures. It's at the end where you really feel how much Ryanosuke meant to Kazuma, an everlasting friend, one he trusted with everything he had, and it was unfortunately what got him killed. It's here where I began to secretly admire the level of dedication the two have as friends, especially Ryunosuke's to Kazuma, long after his death. <sighs> this case, even to this day, makes me sick. I've had games make me feel uncomfortable, but this? This was a different level. The adventure of the runaway room was unsettling, uncomfortable. An absolute clusterfuck, because what is going on? We've barely had time to recover from Kazuma's death, the minor scene after the arrest of Nicolina being the only time we were able to take a moment to decompress, which I don't think that was nearly enough, but I'm used to games not letting their characters mourn, cough cough Xenoblade 1, cough cough. Arriving in the city of London takes the edge off for a moment. A beautiful scene of Ryunosuke and Susato making their way to the Lord Chief Justice's office. One that I still giggle at just how adorable Ryunosuke sounds. Seriously, Mark Oda was such a good casting choice. And we soon arrive at Lord Strongheart's office with Kazuma's attorney band and Karuma at our side. Side note, I mention this too much during my live reacts, but Ryunosuke, both literally and physically carrying on Kazuma's legacy as the new legal student, just fills me with gay joy. I love just how he unequivocally takes on the mantle, without even knowing the full story behind Kazuma's wanting to go to Great 
Britain so badly. I love how he's determined, but he still hasn't found himself yet, found his resolve, but he's doing it for his best friend, the man who believed in him and fought for him when he was at the club. God, God, Keisha, decide why is this man so good? Um, and we're completely thrown into our next case with no preparation, no knowledge of the case. Hell, we don't even have a place to put our fucking luggage yet. It's very sudden, but I think it works. It works because holy hell did I find myself empathizing with this man even more in this case than any other. Because we're learning about this case, about this client in the same stressful environment as our protagonist. I think that's something I really love about this game's writing. There's always something you're learning alongside Ryanosuke. While yes, there can be points where your gears might start cranking a little faster than his, it's typically near the end where things are beginning to wrap up. It's, it's never, at least in my experience, felt like you knew so much ahead of Ryu that you're waiting for him to catch up. And it's always kept me engaged and ready to throw out the next piece of evidence when the time comes. Anyway, fuck Magnus McGilded. We're thrown into the deep end with this man's trial, against the infamous Reaper of the Bailey, Barrack Van Zeeks. With the legal proceedings of Great Britain compared to Japan, where juries are now an active and integral part of gaining your acquittal, and the newfound knowledge that Britain is nothing like Japan. There's many points throughout the trial where Ryanosuke takes a moment and he thinks to himself, this isn't right, something doesn't feel right, something's off. And fuck yeah, it is! This is our taste of a foul win. We get what we wanted in the end, but it's not what we really wanted. Ryanosuke gets his acquittal, Magnus McGilded is free, but there's too many unanswered questions. Tampered evidence, manipulated witnesses, it's unsettling, and too many times throughout the ending of the trial, it felt like this was leading up to a mistrial, where the trial would be deemed invalid due to the realistic fact that we cannot readily provide evidence that the evidence was tampered with, or tell, at least until later, that China was lying. But the judge makes his ruling, and McGilded is given a not guilty verdict. It's bittersweet, more the former than the latter, where a gilded ends his victory with a hearty laugh. Ryanosuke's pleading with the judge to not rule so quickly when there's so much left to discover. The truth escapes our grasp. The truth isn't what matters in this case, and that realization hits Ryanosuke like a fucking truck. Great Britain isn't Japan. Corruption runs rampant and becomes a focal theme in the sequel but lays its seeds here, where we see Ryanosuke lose his trust in the great system he worked hard to study, worked hard to uphold for the sake of his best friend, and it's spitting in his face at his lofty ideals of justice. It's here where I feel out of my element. My experience with Ace Attorney as a whole isn't as grand as the diehard fan probably defending Maya from my earlier comment in the comment section. But at the very least, what little I know is that you always find the truth. The bad guy is almost always put away, and you get to run your victory laps with pride knowing you avoided the worst outcome for your client. Except for this case. And it's so easy to lose your steam alongside a person who has made this his life in some short 30 days. The Adventure of the Clouded Kokoro is the case that made me fall in love with Ryanosuke Naruhodo. Following the events of the last trial, Ryanosuke is understandably dejected. I, in some ways, am too, but I'm also too hooked on the game following that conclusion, so like, obviously, I'm marathoning it through the end. But life never rests. Neither does work. We're quickly thrown into our next case. Soseki Natsume is possibly on the same level of eccentricity as Herlock Sholmes, but like, with paranoia. On crack. In an apparent haunted house, he's arrested on the grounds of stabbing a woman and running from the crime. But he affirms his innocence in his native tongue to the two people who can understand him. Susato and Ryanosuke. But when Soseki asks the man to defend him, he hesitates, he bites his tongue, and he admits openly he doesn't know what to believe. He doesn't know what to trust in the British legal court. He's lost his resolve and his faith in the truth, and he's forgotten what it means to believe in another. 
And fuck, is it refreshing to see. It's so comforting to see this man open his heart and be honest about what he's feeling and how that could affect him defending Soseki. I think we've long passed the point of protagonists needing to bear their mental struggles alone, keeping it hidden behind a facade of their true self. As someone who struggles opening up herself, seeing Ryanosuke do it, so hesitantly, but so wholeheartedly was the first of many moments to come that just made me fall in love with this man as a character. And the thing that really resonates with me the most is that he doesn't find himself again through some mental inward battle of his mind or something ridiculous. It's his friends, Susato and Sholmes, the latter especially, who bring him back into the light. And I know the trope's been done to death, don't tell me this isn't new, but these characters I had already grown to love them like my own friends. Susato because I empathize with her infectious enthusiasm, her unwavering love for the adventures of Herlock Sholmes, her giddy, starry-eyed gaze at the man himself, and her quiet intelligence intact, even against the Reaper of the Bailey himself. Have you seen the way this girl claps back at him? Sholmes, because of him never becoming too overbearing, too annoying despite his eccentricities, he's what I find as a perfect balance of goofiness and humor and seriousness and intelligence. A combination of Zeke and Adam from Xenoblade 2 and Torna, as I once described in a live react. There's a moment, near the closing hours of the prison, where Ryanosuke has to make his decision to figure out what's he to do. Will he put his faith in another? and defend a man who literally has nothing, or will he cower away in distrust and indecision? He turns to Sholmes and asks hesitantly about why he chose to believe him and one too. Why he chose to help him, even if it could have turned out that Ryanosuke had been the killer. The only things I believe in are those I choose to believe in. I make up my own mind about what is to be believed and what is not. If I should like to believe in something, I do. The circumstances can hang as far as I'm concerned. Whether or not one should trust another is, in the final analysis, down to oneself. It is a matter of whether or not one can trust in oneself. Ryanosuke takes a moment, and the words sink in. I lost sight of something crucial. What to believe in, the defendant, justice, or the truth. How to believe, even. But I think I finally worked it out. I've decided I must believe in myself above all else. The shocking events of yesterday's trial still weigh heavily on my mind, but it's time to stop looking backwards. Kazuma believed in me, and Mr. Sholmes believes in me now too, so it's time. Time I learned to believe in myself. As someone who has a hard time opening up, being truthful about her feelings and frequently dancing and fighting back against perfectionism and unrealistic expectations put upon myself. The scene made me break out into tears. At the time, I played it off as the game calling me out, but these are words I needed to hear just as much as Ryanosuke needed them. It's lack of personal trust that causes indecision, that causes an action, and... Ryanosuke is reminded of that with the memory of his best friend in mind. With his red hachimaki flowing ever proudly in the imaginary breeze, Ryanosuke is reminded of Kazuma, the memory of a man who believed in him wholeheartedly the second he said, I didn't do it. And it's upon Sholmes reaffirming that in the second case, where he put his trust into a man that he didn't even know, where Ryanosuke finds the power in belief again. He looks to Soseki and asks for permission to defend him in the trial, promising he'll fight tooth and nail for victory. With an affirming British victory at the end of 1-4, Ryanosuke Naruhodo has proven himself as a character I would never forget. With reinvigorated belief and resolve, we find ourselves two months later, just to compensate for the next trial with Soseki that prominently makes its appearance in the second game because narrative reasons, with arguably one of my favorites of the supporting cast, Gina Lestrade. Gina is what I initially could see as like a really far gone mirror of Ryanosuke. We had our brush of loss of faith last case, and while it was more so a pull down on his confidence and motivation, it wasn't to the point of a complete character changing arc where he went full nihilist. 
which I'm grateful for. I don't think it would have worked for someone like Ryanosuke. Kazuma fills that void just as good. Gina Lestrade is a girl who's been damned from the start, orphaned in a city that already despises those of the lower class, forced to pickpocket in order to get by, and as a result, being even more damned by the adults around her, who could trust her as far as they could throw her. She's been hit with the harsh reality of life in London since she was young, and as such, has grown up to be cold and distrusting. Contrast to Ryanosuke, who's kinda always had this ignorant, lofty idea of justice and equality that is royally shit on the second he takes a step out of his bubble. Hell, it isn't even until 1-4 where the thought of police tampering with the scene of the crime is even considered to be an option for him at first. He's adorably ignorant, but I also think that just adds to his character in a way. He learns realistically, and he doesn't reject the culture shocks compared to some other Japanese students coming to Great Britain for the first time. It's only when the culture shock of the realism of London's legal systems and constructions of society is made apparent to him that he loses footing and loses his faith. Difference here is he has Susato and Sholmes, two people who already have reason to believe in him where he finds himself again. Gina never had that growing up, and I honestly like the idea of seeing this level of stubborn distrust be showcased in a way Ryanosuke can kind of empathize with. He's never gotten to the level that she is, of course, but he knows what it's like not to fully trust someone, and it's in this case where he wants to show what he learned in 1-4 and teach Gina what it means to believe in someone. Because even throughout her stubbornness and smart mouth, Gina does warm up to Ryanosuke, Susato, Iris, and Sholmes. She does grow to see them as her friends, and she learns that nice, fuzzy feeling when she decides to take the risk and put her trust into Ryanosuke, and it pays off tremendously. And it's from here where Ryanosuke's impact on her changes her life tremendously. Being taken under the wing of Inspector Gregson, and being enlisted in the Scotland Yard, which, true if it's another trope I should have seen coming, but fuck did it make me tear up a bit. When it comes to protagonists, especially in narrative-driven games, there's never been one where I found myself truly engrossed in experiencing the story with them. Whether it be silent protagonists like Joker from Persona 5, who has personality and concept, but his lack of spoken dialogue and his construction as a player substitute really make me feel like it's just a guy meant to represent me as opposed to a person I'm experiencing this alongside. Or your classic JRPG hero's journey arc a la Shulk or Rex from the Xenoblade Chronicle series, while good, never made me feel truly engrossed as a protagonist I relate to. To say I felt both in tune with Ryanosuke as a protagonist and as a general character is a severe understatement. Like I mentioned before, I hyperfixate, and when I say the second I started simping for this man and learning about him through dialogue quips, narratively relevant or not, and story regression made me genuinely fall in love with this man as a person, it's a feeling I've never felt about any protagonist ever in my life. When I think of the games I've played, especially in the past two to three years, I can also distinctly call out a character I resonate with, usually due to their story. For Persona 5 Royal, it was Kasumi Yoshizawa. For Xenoblade Chronicles 2, it was Pyra and Mithra. For Buried Stars, it was Inha O. Oh. For Genshin Impact, it's Fischl. Never before has it ever been a protagonist that made me sit back and think, yeah, I can feel a bit of myself in them, and yeah, this is a character I can relate to. And I think Ryanosuke being my first I can actually relate and empathize with you protagonist makes me fall in love with him even more. It's like that final piece of the puzzle clicking into place after you've tried all the other options. Someone who I've watched grow through every trial of the first game. Someone who's evolved from dorkish, untapped potential into a ruthless defense attorney with an unwavering belief in himself and the resolve to defend his client with his final breath. Someone who learns how to trust in himself. It's a story I needed when I was bedridden due to COVID, still spiraling from the absolute mental hell my life has been over the past two years of the pandemic. And it's a story I still need every once in a while to remind myself who I am and where I'm going. <laughs> call it cheesy, call it corny, I don't care. The Great Ace Attorney Chronicles has been the wake-up call I needed for years on end. A call to action, a story that has made me question myself in ways I needed. 
I see myself in so many of these characters. I see my potential in so many of these characters. And it would be a fucking disservice to the emotions that this game made me feel if I don't take the lessons I've learned from this game. The lessons I've learned with Ryanosuke to heart and move forward with my life. I've never done this sort of thing before. I felt so passionate about a character that I've written an essay to this length before. It's kind of embarrassing the more I think about it, but also there's a stupid grin on my face as I'm writing this, and I'm currently crying in my booth as I'm recording this. While there's still a lot I have to learn about myself, my passions, where I'm going, and who I'm to be that I unfortunately cannot hope to achieve in the short span of a year as Ryanosuke does, this game has forever changed my outlook on life, and more specifically myself. And I have the learned friend from the Far East, Ryanosuke Naruhodo, to thank for that. Thank you. <laughs>